Mm-hmm. For the time I had to spend on it today, but we'll never see me in a pair of Crocs. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that, Jim. If everybody could um, rename themselves uh, to have their name be there, you can toggle your mouse over your picture and click the three dots and then click rename, or you can click the participants button, toggle it over your, um, actually you wouldn't know who you are because you're not named yet. So best to do it over your picture. Um, we're gonna give this one more minute and then get started. Marty, you're here. Power is back. We had a power outage. It happens upstate, which is where I am. Uh, it's been out for 24 hours and it just came back. Woohoo! You need solar panels. <laughs> Welcome back from the Stone Age. You know, solar pa- I do. we do need solar panels. And that the issue with solar panels all over the place, there are issues. There are trees around here, so it's not a full days of, a day of sun and you gotta figure out what you're gonna do with the trees. Uh, when you're when you're at Penn South, you want solar panels on the roofs, but you got to figure out what you do with standby power because we're not connected to the grid. So it it's it's a wonderful and important thing, and there should be a hell of a lot more of it, but it's not always easy. I'm going to use that environmental discussion as a segue to officially call our community board four's uh, waterfront parks and environment committee meeting to order. Um, As everybody knows, I think we've all been this before, we are holding our meetings virtually uh, in in part and thanks to the governor's executive order allowing for uh, public meetings to take place this way in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Here we are on Zoom. Um, As usual, we'll be taking items that are on the agenda in the order they're presented this evening. Um, There'll be a presentation on the topic. Questions will be, questions and comments can come from the committee. We will then go to attendees, the public, uh, for any questions or comments that they may have. Um, And if the committee feels necessary, there could be a letter um, and a motion and discussion on that to move things forward. Um, Janine will be running the show tonight. And I believe first um, on our agenda is updates around the Chelsea Waterside Park renovation. Who is steering? uh, Kevin, who's kicking us off on that? We have our friends at Hudson River Park um, and their design team on this AAB or ABB? ABB. I'm sorry, A-B-B. I was I was a little unfocused there. Madeline is trying to get into the Zoom and she's she's having trouble. Um, Let's see. Is she on the attendees side of things? So maybe Janine in the background, if you could, I don't know, send a link directly to her. I, I don't know. But I will start with this um, anyway, and she can jump in when she can jump in. So. Um, pleased to be back uh, with the community board. Um, we have the entire design team again. I think we last saw you in July. Uh, we had a pretty positive uh, meeting, but we did have some comments and we said we'd be back to show you, um, you know, our response to the, to the comments and our progress on the design. Um, I think you'd be happy with it. Um, so um, with that, I think I'm just gonna turn it over to Terry Berger from ABB. She'll lead the landscape discussion and I think uh, John from CDR uh, will be doing the architecture component for the comfort station. Uh, and I'll jump in if, um, if I feel like there's a need to. So Terry, take it away. Okay, thank you. So um, I just need to say next and you'll advance the slides. Is that how we're doing it? Yes, thanks okay, Terry. So, okay, next please. Okay, so good to be with you all again. Um, Just to catch you up on where we are in the process. Um, You all can hear me fine, correct? Okay, great, thank you. Um, So as Kevin said, we last met with you in July. Um, Since that time, we have been refining and doing some design development on the design incorporating comments that we received from you as well as comments that additional comments that we received from the trust. So here we are again at the community meeting and then following this meeting we will take any additional comments and we're going to begin our construction um, document uh, development. Next please. Okay so just as a refresher of where we left off um, on July 9th um, if you go to the next slide this was 
an outline of the most salient and critical comments that we received from you. Um, so just quickly to touch on them was um, to use to st more strategically use plantings to help discourage uh, park users from creating desire lines and cut through paths on the central grain. Uh, the community requested additional bike parking. I believe we had shown some along 24th Street, but you had asked for additional parking. Uh, you did not feel that the, the harvest table or the family style long tables that we were showing in uh, proposing for the picnic area worked and asked for us to reconsider that. Uh, you also asked that we had shown some tiered seating in the dog runs. And I think uh, last time we had shown sort of three tiers for one of them and you felt that that was too high. So you asked us to lower that. Um, so you also asked us to, so we had proposed removing one of the trees that was located in an area of the expanded dog run. And we were doing that to accommodate um, the water play for the dogs in a more centralized location. And you asked us to reconsider that and take a look at uh, preserving that tree. Uh, you also asked us to see if we could provide additional um, photovoltaics and or other green energy solutions incorporated into, particularly into the comfort station, but I believe it was just a general comment, and asked us to take a look at no touch um, type uh, fixtures in the comfort station as well as site locks into the restrooms. Um, also asked for us to consider what it would mean to the design to take into account our current situation where social distancing is so important. And then also asked us, oh, I already mentioned the touchless appliances, right. Next, please. So this was the plan that we presented in July. And really what we're showing is, um, if you can see the red sort of circles and ellipses, those are the areas that we had to really focus on in terms of um, incorporating your comments and looking at, at redesign and refinement. Um, next. So that included the dog runs, the picnic area, the entrance, um, the comfort station, some of the plantings and the synthetic turf field. I uh, don't think we talked about that too much. I don't think you had any um, significant comments about that, but the trust did have a few comments for us. So we've really further refined that um, and developed that part of the design as well. Next. And now this is, we're gonna get into the refined and updated plan. Next. Okay, so um, this is the overall plan. Um, you can see, I think the most significant um, difference that you see on the overall plan is really the, the entrance and we have enlargements for the various uh, specific areas. So I think it'll be a bit easier to see as we get into the project. Um, I'll just give you a second to take that in. Okay, next. Okay, this really outlines, this is a diagram of the circulation. You can see we have that primary sort of curving path that gets us through the park and to the West Side Highway for those that are traversed, want to traverse and get over to um, the riverfront portion of the park. Um, you also see that we're maintaining circulation along the sidewalks, uh, maintaining circulation from 24th Street into the park along the basketball area, uh, the basketball courts. And you can also then see that we have the, still have the three entrances into the dog run. Um, one of the big differences, which we'll touch on a little bit later, is that um, 
if you look at the comfort station, you see now that as before, we're creating this new gateway into the into the sports field area. And although we had accessible access from to to the sports field from the existing entrance, which is the entrance that's a bit farther west, uh, we have been able to add accessible access to the field from the new gateway or from the comfort station um, area. Next. So this is a 3D aerial that kind of gives you the overall lay of the land. Um, you can see the, the entrance area from 11th. Um, you start to start to see really what the, the spatial layout is here and how we've developed it. Um, you get to see some of the thinking in terms of how we're going to be utilizing new trees, tree canopy to start to create and emphasize spaces. Um, I'd just like to chime in, one of the things that we here at the Trust um, really liked about this design is that we've really cut back on the hardscape in this, in this design. So it's really more of a botanic experience and calming, lush, green uh, experience. It's a park within itself and not just a pass through, which was uh, really the, a really a major goal in this project. And I'd also just like to point out Madeline did make it on Zoom, so she's, she's here too. Okay. Sorry, Terry. That's fine. No, great. Um, go to the next slide, please. So just to talk a little bit about lighting, um, we are continuing with the standard that's throughout the park, which is the Riverside um, Luminaire. We will be retrofitting all of the existing lights with LED luminaires um, instead of the existing high pressure sodium. Uh, likewise, with the sports field lights, those are to be retrofitted with LEDs as well. We are adding some other accent type lighting throughout the park, including festoon lighting at the picnic area, and we're integrating uh, various LED strip lighting in certain specific accent areas, which you'll see in the next plan. Next slide, please. So you start to get a sense of um, what the light distribution will be in the park. Um, you can see there are some accent lights that are happening in the picnic area. We're using those, those LED strips in um, the seat walls that are around the picnic area, as well as at the entrance, as well as the festoon lighting in the picnic area. Uh, in the dog run, again, there's accent lighting in there. Uh, we will be introducing some other lighting there to make sure that the light levels are appropriate for the dog run. Uh, we do know, and I think we mentioned this the last time we talked to you, that we took existing light levels, so we know what we're working with as a base, and we know that that has not been sufficient. So we will be bringing up the light levels so that they are uh, more appropriate for the, for the use. Um, <clears throat> and then, I think when John talks about the comfort station, he can talk a little bit more about this, but obviously there'll be some exterior lighting that happens in the comfort station to make sure that that's appropriately illuminated. Next. So this is just an overall plan indicating what the planting um, strategy was for us. Um, we obviously were looking to preserve uh, as many of the healthy existing mature trees as we could, both within the park as well as the street trees, uh, looking to bolster what buffer there was uh, along the West Side Highway in particular, looking to accentuate some of the landforms that we're creating and some of the existing um, landforms, particularly uh, around the edges of the central lawn. So on the east end of the lawn, um, really looking to strategically use those plantings to uh, help deter people from using these, the cut, create the cut through paths uh, to provide seasonal year-round seasonal interest and to really provide 
uh, more ornamental plantings. Um, and I just yeah. to say, particularly on the east entrance, um, just keeping with that theme of having a really lush entrance into the park, the idea was to have low ornamental plantings to really kind of draw you into the park. And then once you're in there, you're kind of like in a room in, it, in itself. So, and then Terry spent a lot of time on that. Okay, next. So this is uh, our tree uh, planting palette. Uh, we've selected trees based on the particulars of the site, um, the urban condition, the, the required um, aspect of the site, um, what we're trying to do in specific locations to provide a variety of seasonal interest. Um, so just as an example, um, I can, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on them, but I, I think it's worth noting that, um, so just as an example, the, um, the tree in the lower left-hand corner, um, commonly known as the golden rain tree, uh, although that is not a native tree, it is an adapted tree. And a lot of times we try to stick with natives, but in this case, um, this was a pretty um, important choice for us because we felt that it was a really appropriate tree for providing buffer along the West Side Highway. This goes in an area um, that is sort of central in the park where there's going to be a seating area. You'll see it again when the plans come up. It provides flowering um, interest in the spring and then in the fall you may have seen it. Um, it, it provides these little papery seed um, enclosures which are a really lovely like fall interest and then they also have the added benefit of you know, a light breeze kind of creates this sort of fluttering and noise sort of um, aspect to them. So in addition, there's a number of flowering understory trees that we're looking to utilize throughout the park for interest and then also to give that second layer, um, that second layer under some of the more mature trees. So we wanna get them sort of in the vicinity of those larger mature trees which we're trying to preserve. Um, the other tree to maybe no to make note of is the Gladitia up in the left hand corner. Uh, that's a tree that we've selected to use in the picnic area and that is primarily because it's got a light open airy sort of head right canopy that isn't going to be really too oppressive in terms of like a heavy canopy, um, but it will provide a, a good amount of shade and filtered shade. Um, so anyway, we thought those were those were good choices for that. Um, so next, please. And then a whole variety of um, of shrubs and ornamental grasses again. Select, selected specifically for the site, selected for seasonal interest in color, as well as for habitat. Um, we will be including some evergreens. Uh, one of the things that I think is not on here, which we probably also will be including, is there are some existing taxis baccata repandans on the site. Uh, so we will probably be utilizing that again and maybe some other evergreens. We, wanted, we do want to make sure that we have a good structure of evergreens um, as well for the winter, uh, but many of the deciduous plants that we have selected also have very interesting aspects to them for winter interest. Next. Again, these are, these are some of the perennials that we would be using. Next. And then this gives you a sense of the variety of the seasonal interest um, from January through December. There's going to always be something going on. Um, That's the goal. And then obviously also the plant selections are, um, you know, we're, we're all, we've also considered maintenance regimens, right? Where Hudson River Park 
has traditionally done a great job with maintenance. However, you know, all of these kinds of parks and open spaces, it's always a challenge with maintenance. So we really like to focus on not just with plants, but all of the material selections we make to make sure that we're looking for um, low maintenance, um, that low uh, plants and materials that require low maintenance, but are really getting the job done that we, we need them to do. Next. So um, segue into other materials, as we talked about before, one of the primary goals of the project uh, was to see what materials existed on site. The site has a lot of granite, which um, continues to be in very good condition and is certainly reusable for pavements and other things throughout. This identifies pavements um, that are existing that we're looking to utilize um, to remove, salvage, clean, and reinstall in, in new locations. Next. So this starts to show you what we're looking at in terms of a paving um, pattern. Uh, this is an enlargement of the entrance. So we've got the item number one at the top there is the existing um, granite block pavers, which we're looking to salvage, which are a, a light gray color, thermal finish. Um, there are some large slabs of pink granite throughout, and we're looking to salvage those and cut those down into smaller sizes um, consistent with the rectangular blocks. And then we know we don't have quite enough material um, to satisfy all of the paving areas, so we would be supplementing, augmenting um, these existing materials with new granite. So we're looking to introduce a, a darker color for um, that variety. And we're, you, you can kind of see it in the rendering, in the plan rendering, what we're looking to do is to utilize the lighter gray <clears throat> pavers um, as the center of the pathways through and that the edges are a combination kind of like a pixelated matrix at the edges of the new dark pavers and some of the light gray pavers as well as accents of the pink which is the bottom image starts to express how we're looking to use like these these new pink pavers or these repurposed pink pavers um, as accents um, in the paving pattern. One of the nice things about um, doing this kind of random um, pattern also is that it is um, one of the easier kinds of um, paving patterns for someone to maintain because there isn't this um, finite precision to banding or other patterns. It lends itself to, you know, if a maintenance worker has to come in at some point and replace a paver, fairly easy to do. It doesn't have to be that exact gray right there or that exact black right there. Next. Next. Okay, so just to touch on some of the features of the main entry, uh, one of, as I mentioned earlier, one of the comments was about bike racks. We have incorporated uh, bike racks at, at the entry, so just left of the entry there, if you see number one, uh, we also will be including signage uh, at the entry. And as you go into the entry, as um, Kevin said, we're looking to do a very lush planting there. We're introducing new flowering trees at the entrance, as well as um, really layered understory plantings below those trees. Once you enter in the pathway, um, your sight lines go straight across the park and you kind of start to get a hint of the tree grove at the picnic uh, area and then in your mid-ground you'll also see the berm, uh, the planted berm, uh, which is number five. Uh, six, we're looking to use granite curbing throughout the park and then just to the left of the main entrance you 
can see the space that we've allocated uh, for the future vendor kiosk. And then that number seven is indicating space allocated for a little bit of back of house for the vendor, as well as an area where um, you can continue uh, a space for the community composting that it's currently happening. And number four is this is the um, aligned seating along the pathway. Hey, Terry, can you uh, can you tell the community board what the width is of the entrance there? Um, the width is, I'm going to say it's a roughly 20 feet. Okay. It, yeah. Taylor, Taylor might be able to be a little bit more precise. It's about 12 at its skinniest. Okay. I, I just mentioned that because that's one thing that's different than before. Uh, we thought it was a little too too wide open before, and so now it's down to 12 feet. Um, so it's 12 uh, um, right at the narrowest, Taylor, but what, opens up closer to 20? Yes, probably. Okay. Okay, next. And so here's the conceptualization of what that space will look like in reality. Um, the curbs defining the entry edges there would be, you know, raised a bit. Um, we're looking at doing low fencing on top of those, on top of those curbs to help protect the planting um, that's within them. Um, and as I was saying, you can look if you look through into the mid, the mid, um, mid ground there, you can start to see the plantings that are layered sort of behind on that berm uh, adjacent to the picnic area. Okay, next. And then this is the palette of um, furnishings. Over on the left are loose tables and chairs that we envision being associated with the integrated custom bench, which is adjacent to the vendor kiosk. Um, those we could see being maintained and monitored by the vendor. Um, the standard H, um, HRPT bike rack, which is a ribbon rack, which has been used on other projects. The trash receptacle also used on other projects at HRP. Um, as I mentioned earlier, granite curbs. And then in the lower left are the existing benches. Um, while the wood is not in great condition on these benches, the um, supports and framework for the benches are all stainless steel and all still in really good shape. So we're looking at repurposing those with new wood, um, you know, slight modification to the design of the benches um, by using different different lengths and different spacing on the um, the wood slats. Next. Just um, just so the community board knows that the movable furniture is, um, we, we definitely intend to do furniture very similar to this, but the specific model, we're still working through with our maintenance people and making sure like the specific model is totally maintainable and what we want to use. So movable furniture where you see it, but not, maybe not necessarily that particular model. Just want to be sure. So. Okay, and then this highlights um, the custom bench seating um, that we're proposing, um, utilizing stainless steel for the supports and the armrests. Um, what this bench really starts to do is to create, you know, a variety of options for seating. We all know we like to go to parks and there's nothing better than having a variety of options for for where to sit in the park, how to sit, how to utilize the space. So this bench provides a variety of those kinds of options. So on the left side of the bench, you've got a more typical armrest. And then as you progress um, around the bench towards the west, the arm starts to become more of a, a small table, um, a place where you can have your lunch, a place where you can put your laptop, um, so you can do some work in the park. Um, there are also spaced, sorry, mosquito attack over here. Um, 
they are also spaced um, at a distance that would uh, deter someone from laying on them, um, which is, you know, an important way to help monitor usage in the park. Next. Next. So the picnic area um, directly opposite the uh, playground. Um, you've, you've seen this before. The layout hasn't really changed too much. The size hasn't changed too much. We've really just refined um, some of the details of it. We're still looking to do um, sort of a threshold of granite paving as you enter the space. The ground plane would be a stabilized gravel. Um, the nice thing about that is it's very gardenesque feeling. Um, it, it's stabilized though with an organic material that um, helps it to be um, a little more cohesive and not like loose gravel, um, which can be kind of messy. Um, but then again, this um, organic binder actually allows um, it to be permeable. So any water, any rainwater coming through here is going to get straight down, which is a real benefit to the tree grove um, that's proposed. In addition, there's the festoon lighting, um, which we think is a really nice feature. Uh, in in, in, it's enclosed by these stone walls. We're, we're looking to utilize um, reclaimed stone from the existing uh, park and then um, seating. Um, and then in response to the community's comment about the harvest tables, we've looked at doing um, more um, integrated tables and chairs. And you'll see if you go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, start to see what those tables are like. Uh, they're very similar to what is uh, the existing tables and chairs that are currently in the park. Um, there is um, planting surrounding on the outside, uh, the stone walls. And then the one thing I, I neglected to mention when we were at the, at the plan is that um, we are making some minor modifications to the play area directly opposite, uh, particularly to the entrance to accommodate stroller parking. And we are also um, planning to change that fence at the same time. It is currently a chain link fence and we're looking at doing a, a more ornamental wire grid fence there. Um, but in this image, you start to see what the, what the festoon lighting would look like and how the space would feel. Um, just one quick thing, the, the trees are, are far along in this image. So the, the furniture that we're gonna propose, uh, and this is a recommendation from the community board last time, is to provide some umbrellas uh, for the furniture too. So as the canopy develops, we, we can get some shade. So we will be doing that. It's just not shown in this rendering. Right. Next. So you get to see here are all of the materials, which I've already mentioned, um, what we're anticipating things um, like, like the stacked stone wall to start to look like. Um, can see what the stabilized gravel looks like. It's actually a material that's used elsewhere in the park, so you're probably already familiar with it, or in, in Hudson River Park overall, not in the existing park. Next. Okay, the dog runs. Um, so I don't think that the, the overall shape or size is is any different than what we had shown you last time. We obviously have done quite a bit more um, development on it. Um, in order to maintain that existing tree, which previously we had proposed to be removed, if you <clears throat> see where number one is, um, that dark brown circle that you see in the middle of that tiered seating, that's where that tree lives. And so in the small dog run there, um, we are proposing to do the tiered seating around that dog run to help around, sorry, around that tree to help protect the tree and to provide, um, you know, that elevated seating that we talked about previously, which gives you a really nice vantage um, over the entire dog run. 
Um, in order to accommodate that, we had to shift around some of where we were locating the granite walls. And so um, we have done that. Um, so that tiered seating now backs up against um, granite walls, which are be those repurposed granite walls. Um, we also, um, I think otherwise it's, it's generally the same. If you see number four, the lower right of the small dog run, that's now the new location uh, for the water play for, this, for the small dog run area. We've added benches as well, single um, six foot long um, freestanding benches. And um, I think otherwise that's sort of this, everything else is pretty similar in terms of the, 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 the small dog run. Um, most noticeable obviously is the graphic that we're, that we're showing on both the small and the, do and the large dog run. Um, we're looking at utilizing the HRPT colors um, to create this really bold graphic. Um, on the asphalt paving. So this would all be color coat sealed, um, which is a great surface. Uh, it's done elsewhere on other dog runs at uh, Hudson River Park. Uh, the entrance pavements, um, the Sally Port type entrances, we still have the three entrances. Those will be granite. Um, and then looking at the large dog run, again, number one, you see we still have the tiered seating. We've lowered that to the two tiers. Um, there is still one um, larger mound um, rather than multiple mounds as exists now in the dog run. Um, and then you can see number four is the new location of the water uh, play area in uh, the large dog run. And again, we're utilizing that stone wall um, as a backdrop to that, um, to one, help protect from water spray from moving out onto the sidewalk there. Um, and it also gives us uh, the benefit of being able to um, kind of stack up some of the um, granite blocks um, to, to utilize for other water features um, in that area. I may have missed something. Um, so somebody else feel free to jump in. There's a lot going on here. Um, we are also providing storage cabinets. Um, if you look up on the west side, just adjacent to where number six is, number six, which is the Sally Port entrance that comes in from the park. We have um, a couple cabinets there. Uh, we're looking to do stainless steel cabinets similar to what we've done on another project. Um, one to house <clears throat> the um, the water management system for the for the water play, as well as a storage cabinet for for maintenance equipment. Next, and then this just um, helps to show you um, what the clearances are between the some of the vertical um, elements. I think our, our narrowest um, clearance is the four foot nine there on the sort of the middle western edge there between that existing tree guard, sorry, existing tree and the new guard that we're putting around that existing tree and the proposed uh, tiered seating. So these clearances are much greater than what exists now. I think in some places right now between the mounds and the other elements, um, I think if you have three feet, that's a lot um, in some spots. And the visibility is greatly improved in this design also. Uh, I think you can see that the mound heights are labeled there too. So you, you'll be able to get a full picture of what's going on in the park from one location. Okay, next. Um, this diagram shows you what we're uh, contemplating uh, for the fences, um, perimeter conditions, and the separating fences in between um, and walls, uh, kind of doing a combination of both. On the west side, we are maintaining that existing concrete wall. We will be repairing it. Um, and painting it, you know, look really new and fresh. 
adding fencing to it to a height that's appropriate. Um, we will make sure we have six feet from the upper level of the tiered seating um, in that location. Actually, for most of that, uh, sorry, for most of that stretch, we won't have fencing there and you'll see that because we still have the, um, the canopy um, and the vertical um, wood trellis that, that you'll see in a minute. Um, we've got low curbs um, with, six, with a six foot high um, overall height included um, fence. Um, and then you can see we've outlined where we're reusing the salvaged granite walls. Um, the one thing that I think is a, a change is that we're looking to use a lower fence in the, um, on the northern edge. Um, since this is a smaller dog run, we, we feel comfortable that we can utilize a four foot high fence there and we don't need a six foot high fence. Um, so certainly if you have thoughts about that, we're interested to hear, to hear them. Um, we are looking to do a more decorative steel fence along the 11th Avenue uh, side, but then all of the other fencing um, at the perimeters and the separation between will be a more open wire grid type fence, which you'll see in a second. Next. And this outlines um, some of the other amenities and furnishings where trash receptacles are being located, where hose uh, reels are being located, um, the various seating types and the tree protection. Next. And then this gives you a, a general flavor for, for what the space is going to look like. Um, there also will be over on the left, um, you can start to see that we're looking to do a, um, some signage within the dog run. This is actually a, a donor type um, sign where um, donors get recognized um, through this signage. Just this a is fun, or just a fun sign that our, the pentagram who did our signage program came up with. Right. And the, just the, so the community board knows the colors are, this looks super saturated and plan renderings, the colors are a little faded. So it's somewhere in between. It's tough to get this, the colors to render right um, in these Zoom meetings. But anyway, it's, those are the colors, but maybe not so intense. Okay, next. And then these are the materials and furnishings. Um, so again, I've already talked about some of these, but you start to get a sense of what those are going to be. Next. And then this is a bit more detail on those, on those custom tiered seats. Um, the, the bench seat on the top is in the large dog run, backs up against the existing concrete wall. We're looking at using a, a perforated metal um, stainless steel actually uh, for the riser portions of the seat. And then the, um, the tread part or the seat part will be, um, will be wood. And then behind that is that screen um, with the bit of a canopy, which is a combination of wood and stainless. And then on the lower is the small dog run that's the, uh, going around the existing tree. Um, and it will incorporate a tree grate around um, the opening. Um, obviously, it's a pretty big tree, but we're going to make sure that there's no safety issues there and also that there, um, the tree grate will allow the, the um, trust to be able to open that opening up as the tree grows. Um, but we don't want to obviously have it open now so that garbage gets in or it's, um, it's a dangerous situation for dogs. Um, the other thing we're doing is that there will be um, removable panels or hinged panels in the larger areas of the seating and that will just, um, that's just to accommodate access to below, 
to below for cleaning. It's also potentially a place where some storage can happen if additional storage is needed. And likewise, both of these will be elevated above the ground by about an inch to allow for um, drainage and also to allow for washing out underneath. Next. Okay, hey, Terry, I just want to give you a time caution because we're 45 minutes into our slot here. So uh, Okay, you, let's let's move along. Um, so these are these are the elements that you've seen before for the dog run. I think maybe the only difference is um, a decorative fence um, along 11th Avenue. It's going to be something analogous to this. Um, next. And then the turf field. Um, you've seen this. I think the big changes are we are adding striping um, for youth size fields. Um, so we have the overall size field, which is a 180 by 110 um, field. And then going in the north-south direction, um, we're striping for two youth fields. Uh, we've also, in the um, practice area, um, we'll be putting permanent markers at like a 15-foot grid uh, just to help with practice and drills that, that would be done. Um, there'll be new bleachers. We're looking at new containers that will be branded um, with HRPT. Um, I think that's it. Um, we did, the one thing I guess to mention is at the, at the comfort station, which John is going to talk about in more detail. Um, I think we should have a comfort station talk. Sorry, Terry, not to, to cut you off. Sorry, what? That we should probably, unless there's more specific detail or significant change to the field, let's jump right to comfort station because that's yeah, definitely going to be the most, I yeah. just want to point out one thing, and that is that we are providing an accessible ramp now um, to get you from the from through the gateway of the comfort station um, down to the field. Whereas before, the uh, the accessible route was uh, via the existing entrance, which is closer to numbers three and four. Next. And next. So just one quick thing on the field, just so you know, it, we're providing a misting station, a uh, location exactly to be determined, but these fields do tend to get a little warm. Um, so just like uh, City Parks is doing in their bigger synthetic turf fields, it'll be a little misting station so you can cool down. That's, a, I think, a pretty significant improvement. Okay, comfort station. All right, John. You're muted, John. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm well caffeinated, so I will try to speed up um, my slides a little bit. Um, just the first slide is, is just showing the location of the comfort station, which is nestled between existing tree lines, existing paths, and existing fences for the playing field. It's anchored in a central position to most of the other programs, or all the other programs in the park. And our strategy was to pull apart the men's women and men, women's room to create a kind of uh, area to secure the playing field, but also to create uh, clear sight lines from the rest of the park for exit and entrance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we, we took uh, recommendations to kind of simplify the palette um, and some of the moves. So here you'll see that uh, we kind of made the palette choices a little bit in more line with the rest of the park. And you can see here also kind of a clear portal to, to the playing fields. Uh, next. And again, here you'll see um, a direct connection. There will be a, a rolling security grill that will run on the backside of the solar panels um, that will be on, uh, you know, um, mechanically operated. Uh, next one. So quickly to point out, number one is the men's room. Uh, sorry, women's room. Two is the men's room. I'm going to jump to uh, the bleacher area, which is uh, number eight. I can't, it's, well, the bleacher area is next to number seven. And there's now an ADA ramp, which is a V-shape that connects uh, what, uh, the level of the comfort stations, which is above the 100-year floodplain, uh, down to the playing fields. Um, next. 
Oh, sorry, if you could stay on this for a second. The blue area is uh, exploration we're doing in trying to reuse um, a good quantity of the existing granite stone to uh, cut it and reconfigure it uh, to create interesting patterns that are really durable for the park. We're still developing that. We're uh, working with the fabricator uh, to, to push that forward. Next. The blue areas here are um, a layered metal grating or grill, which can create shadow and depth, but also are very, very durable. Uh, next. Here's just some uh, the, uh, grillage in context. We think the security grill can be the same material uh, as those areas. Those areas could be maybe used for plantings as well. The uh, slide on the right would be what the backer panel looks like. Next. So uh, another recommendation was to add um, solar panels. We've uh, more than doubled them from eight to 19. Um, we all also um, really working with ex really big existing trees which limit the amount of sun exposure. So the areas that are um, not covered in panels are either shaded or act as a buffer between the playing field, the errant soccer balls and the panels themselves. So the, the green roof, uh, we think also is a very good direction as well as the panels. Um, you know, because it reduces energy costs, it reduces storm runoff, uh, lasts twice as long as uh, traditional roofs, um, and on and on it goes. So next one. Um, here you can just see in context uh, all the elements. And um, we did get a recommendation to look at using site locks. Uh, in the New York climate, it is not recommended by our mechanical engineer to use exterior site locks. It makes sense in interior spaces also would increase the footprint um, 15 to 20% of each, uh, each uh, men's and women room, I should say, which would bite into the playing field uh, even more than it is now. Um, let's see, we talked about adding the ramp. Next. That's it. So oh, one other thing to mention is we will have downlighting, which we'll try to integrate into the solar panel structure. Um, so it's, it's more about the lighting than it is about the fixturing. And, uh, and that's it. Great. She skimmed over, um, but it, it is kind of impressive that most, we can basically power the lighting in the park, not the recreational lighting, but the lighting in the park through the solar panels. Uh, so that's, a, I think that's pretty great. That is uh, pretty great. And for ending on that, thank you very much for this. Um, Jean, if we could, oh, next steps, I guess. Um, yeah, let's hear that. Or do we, let's go to, committee comments, Jean, if we can stop sharing the screen so we can see everybody, if that's okay. Um, I'm gonna, I have one comment and then I will go to the committee whom I hope will be brief. This was a, an update um, presentation based on our comments back from July. Uh, this is not a rewrite. This is um, hopefully simply a um, job well done. Let's get to work on putting it in the ground. Um, my one comment is um, the east side of Chelsea Waterside Park right now has a fabulous row of limelight, limelight hydrangeas. And I hope you will put limelight hydrangeas back into the planting palette. Um, that's totally vain and selfish, but they're, they're really striking there. Um, and then my only other um, question was how many uh, bike racks are there going to be, or that's not based on part of this design. The, the bike racks will be there. I don't, I don't have the actual count. Uh, maybe Taylor, I think it's 12. I do. There's, um, right now we've accommodated four at the entrance and you can get four to five bikes in each of them. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Um, I'm going to go to the- well, we, will have we will have beautiful plantings there. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the committee. If everybody could please use the raise hand function. Um, Alan, you're up first. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I'll try to make this brief. Beautiful presentation, beautiful design. Um, uh, probably one of the best presentations I've seen um, as a presentation um, in, a, in, in a long time. A couple of questions. Um, I, I'm concerned about the, um, the picnic area. Um, in that we don't have any tables. Uh, I know this was discussed back then, but they're all four or six seat um, tables, chairs. Uh, what happens when folks want to come in um, and have a birthday party, family parties? Um, 
are these, do they need to move these together or can we get some large tables in there? That's, that's one of my questions. I have one question on the, on the door grunt, so let me put that there. Does the hose reach to the other side, to the west side? Okay, that's it for, for the door grunt. But um, the, the, the picnic tables, I think, um, should be, prior to the whole park being redesigned with the children's park, there were picnic tables there and people did have uh, large parties there. Um, so um, that, that's something I think that should be um, looked at again. Yeah, we're still looking at the uh, furniture, Alan, and we'll take that into consideration, okay? Okay. Um, is there, I know we, we, we talked about the entranceway, the main area, the walkway, is there a, a large open uh, space for events? Hopefully we have events sometime soon. Because it doesn't seem to, it just seems to be the same, at least to the west side, but we talked about having a, a, an open space for events. Well, we have a, a fairly large lawn panel. Um, we, we, we traded a lot of asphalt and a lot of pavement for, for green. Um, there, there is an area that a small gathering could, could, could gather, but it's not intended to be a, a, an event space per se. I know that the friends would run events there. Um, there. There would be, I don't know. Also the picnic area, the, the furniture's um, movable. So, you know, if we really wanted to do something, we could do something there too. Right, that's correct. The, the picnic area would be the area that would be cleared out okay. for events. All right. Um, I love the benches. I love the seating there with, with, the, uh, with the armrests, with the tables there. Very good idea. Good, a good touch. Um, I'm done. Nice. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Really great design. And, and very prompt, great responses from you guys. You did a great, terrific job. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Blake? Thanks, Jeffrey, and echoing uh, Alan's sentiment about uh, the great presentation. And just the two quick things, um, you know, one is uh, around the trash bins. Uh, you know, that's not really an error that we address, but, uh, you know, I would hope that the design is something that would discourage overflow and, uh, you know, discourage the um, uh, people putting in household trash in those bins you know, and also um, have a place for recycling, uh, you know, as um, an element of of um, the trash uh, and recycling bin design. And um, the second point was just, um, you know, I think it would be a, it's a great longer term idea to have a vendor, uh, you know, in that space that you, um, uh, a portion for that, you know, particularly a local business vendor. And, uh, you know, I would just want to make sure that there's ways for them to be visible, um, you know, from the street. Uh, it looked like there might be a tree or something that would prevent people from um, the street from seeing them. Uh, and so, you know, I would just want to make sure that if there is a vendor there uh, in the future, that there's uh, you know ways for them to um, attract customers from um, outside of the park area. Thank you. I will just say that trash is in our wheelhouse, <laughs> and there will be uh, trash recycling and compost bins there, and uh, and we actually uh, do uh, an audit constantly on what trash is being put into our bins. So uh, we have a pretty uh, sophisticated trash um, program. And um, certainly it will be here in uh, Chelsea Waterside. And we're gonna keep an eye on making sure that the ornamental plantings uh, do make uh, the concession uh, vis visible. Thank you. Thanks, Blake. Um, Leslie. Um, this is just really a big thank you. I mean, you guys hit it out of the park. That was the most thoughtful and that was the, one of the best presentations. The only thing I would say or ask for is if Terry could present for every parks project <laughs> because that was awesome. Um, so thank you. And especially guys, thank you for putting in more of those uh, solar panels that, and that it's gonna light up most of the park. Awesome, thank you so much. Leslie to Marty. I was going to say go. something. I was going to say something very much the same, Leslie. Thank you for saying that. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. But more important than that 
is thank you for listening to us at the last presentation. Uh, the solar panels, the mature tree, um, to name two, uh, you incorporated into this design and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. Thank you very much. And David. Yeah, great presentation. I really appreciate the way there'll be more green space. Uh, I walked around the park today and noticed that there were some areas of green that just felt like leftover uh, tokens. Uh, so this is a huge improvement. Uh, and I know this seems petty in comparison to everything else, but to return to the site locks in the bathroom, um, I think the amount of space that you would lose to the park by creating the site locks would be negligible. Uh, I can't imagine that the HVAC has to maintain comfort zone temperatures inside. That doesn't seem like a priority for a space that people are only in for minutes. Uh, people don't like to touch the door hardware to get into and out of those. People in wheelchairs don't appreciate having to push a door open. People don't feel secure inside when there's a door that shuts behind them. Uh, the way you've got the men's room set up right now, when the door swings open, people outside will be able to see men at urinals. I know you can fix this. It's not that big a challenge. I mean, I, I guess I'll go back on that, David, to say, I think this is the final design presentation. Uh, so is, is this, are you looking for a, to really have site locks be a part of this design because of a door factor? Well, we asked for it before. And as I said, it doesn't seem like that big a challenge. Uh, I know it can be solved. And right now we're at sort of schematic design in terms of that building. I don't see why it can't be uh, introduced as things go forward. I guess yeah. uh, if, if you can hear me, um, my response is if we're looking for sustainability, and we're trying to maximize solar energy to have open um, open site locks uh, exit and entrances is kind of counter to that. So you're actually just throwing hot or cooled air out. And we're going to look at doing uh, sensor driven doors, touchless fixtures and fittings. But I really in this day and age not would not have exterior site locks in a climate like New York. Yeah, and it, and it does take up more space. I mean, we, we did, it's not that we didn't look at it. No, we looked at it and, and we okay. not comfortable with it. Well, I guess we that's it, our answer. It, sure, because it's, it's not a crazy idea. I mean, if we could do it, we would. True. Okay. Uh, any other members of the committee? Uh, Scarlett, as an honorary member, is very excited <laughs> about the dog run as well. Um, <laughs> So I am going to go to the public. Anybody from the public, uh, questions um, or specific comments? Um, yes, let's bring Zazel over, please. Jean, if we can. Yeah, Zazel, are you there? Let's see. Cesar, can you unmute? There we go. Uh, yes, thank you uh, very much for the wonderful presentation to uh, Terry and her colleagues and uh, John. Uh, what's happening in the corner of 24th and the West Side Highway? That kind of unused space at the tip of the sports field. Most of it was captured for this to expand the synthetic turf field, uh, but the granite, I mean, I, Terry, you can answer this if you like. It, it looks like you were muted, so I jumped in, but <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Terry, you want to take it? Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. The, the, the granite that um, faces the West Side Highway is going to be maintained. Um, it needs some minor repair, which we're going to include in this project, but um, we will be lowering. So right now that overlook area is, is um, several feet higher than the field elevation. So we are going to be creating um, a, basically a, a low wall on the interior of that existing stone wall 
that um, is adjacent to the highway in order to lower it down to the field elevation. So there won't be that grade differential anymore and that area will become um, contiguous part of the synthetic turf area and be dedicated to a practice kind of warm up drill area. Oh, great. Thank you so much. And I also wanted to just ask quickly about the width of the path, the walkways, the pathways. So they do vary a bit, um, but they are in the neighborhood of 12 feet. There are some, Taylor, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are some paths that are a little bit less than 12 feet. For okay. example, the path that leads into the dog run, I believe that's at eight feet. Um, but predominantly, they're, they're about 12 feet, not, not larger than 12 feet. Thank you. Plenty of room for people to walk by each other. Thanks. Thank you. Um, let Gabriella, you had your hand up, and I think you've been brought over for a question. Uh, yes, I'm just going to give you some feedback from a five-year-old, since there isn't another one that I can see on the talk. Uh, my daughter was concerned about the integrated seating and what it means to have chairs that are at a preset distance from the tables uh, for, for, for kids that's a bit too large of a gap for them to comfortably use the chairs next to the tables when they're integrated. Um, and also, since the chairs appear to be made of metal mesh, you know, she said, oh, I could, I could kneel on them, but it would, hurt. it would hurt my knees. So that's one thing, since kids are not often considered in such plans. Um, the other thing is we had, we had liked the idea of the larger tables. I know that that was removed between July and now. Uh, the reason why those, are, again, are really good for kids is for those outdoor birthday parties, which can't be held at four-person tables. Um, that's all. Those are great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Beatrice. <laughs> just, just, and I think, to... Madeline, you, ooh, Kevin, sorry, you furniture is sort of still being finalized in terms of yes. its... Uh... Yes, we're still looking at furniture. Okay, great comments then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other final thoughts? I, I, this is just, um, what a victory this is for comfort stations to be coming to Chelsea Waterside Park. Um, Speaking of that, <laughs> sorry. Along with the fabulous design. Gwen. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't know how to raise my hand in this. <laughs> um, anyway, I just wondered why is the women's comfort station smaller than the men's? Um, I, th I think it's within 10 square feet. It might be the layout makes it look smaller, but it's not uh, a smaller space. It's not. Okay. I think there's a mechanical room that's right. part of it. And of the men's room, and that's why it seems different to you. Exactly. Right. Thank you. Yep. Are, we gonna name the, are we going to name the uh, comfort station after Bob, our former <laughs> member? I mean, he, li he literally, when I joined the board, he was talking about what was underground there for that station. And I'm not kidding. I, you know, I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> I think that we could take that up a little bit further down the line. Um, but for tonight, does the committee feel strongly one way or another if we need to memorialize anything in a letter? Uh, the group has been outstanding at incorporating our feedback. I um, mean, I'm not sure we have anything too uh, technical or specific to add this round. I would say usually our chair has a lot to say, but I guess he can't anymore. That is, that's true, actually. He'll be a voting president, not eligible on, uh, exactly. on this. Um, so thank you to the trust. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, John. Uh, you know, to what my colleague said for an outstanding presentation. Please, let's just get this done. I look forward to more details on timeline and construction documents um, the next time around. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Everyone. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, with that, I want to move uh, briskly to item two on our agenda, a um, place called Balsley Park on the southeast corner of 57th Street and 9th Avenue. Um, Anita pointed out that it is not a park, it is a pop, uh, privately owned public spaces. These are uh, uh, a nature of public space across the city of New York as a, a part of our zoning code. Think plazas on Park Avenue, think 6th and a half Avenue. 
um, in Midtown between 6th and 7th, 5th uh, and 6th, um, and this corner of 9th Avenue. Um, it's been closed for quite some time. This is how it's made its way onto the agenda. It's sort of been an eyesore um, at a time when public space is desperately needed right now. Um, a lot of folks have been working on this issue. The Speaker's Office, Jesse um, and Janine have been involved with this. Uh, Carl, I believe you're here. Um, we're going to hear from, uh, was Ronnie Eldridge brought over, Janine? Yes, I brought her over. Okay, great. Um, folks at the Sheffield, um, Ronnie, I believe you're here. Um, if you wanna share some, some initial information, updates or, or what have you um, about that spot. I know the, the building manager might have been coming from uh, I'm the sorry. as well. No. Ronnie, the... I don't know how... You're there. Yeah. Hi. I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't know how to unmute it. <laughs> We've got you now and in picture. Well, we're not making a presentation, but it was a wonderful presentation and the park is beautiful. Um, I don't know if everybody understands the, the history of the park and uh, trying to... Re put it together today. I was thinking how often I've interrelated with the park. Anyway, the park was, was a, a bonus. I mean, the park was made because the builder of this building, I think it was a man named Hyman Shapiro, um, agreed to do the park and then the plaza in front of the Sheffield in return for the added walls. That was in 1977. We can't find the original plan and we can't find with the city planning commission, they can't find it either. His plan was to take the, the park, what the, ground, the land that's the park, connect it through the Park Fen Dome to the plaza in front of the Sheffield. That's what he wanted to do, make it a continuous uh, park. But that fell apart and it didn't work. So I've, it was, I, I think it was designed or redesigned in 1980, I have. And I happened to be at that time, the director of community and government affairs at WNET. And that plan, although I came, I think before or after, that plan was based around an amphitheater that WNET was gonna use either to show things or to have discussions and that fell apart. So then the park just began to fall in disrepair. And by this time I was a member of the city council and, the, and that was in my district. So Adam and I had many discussions. The green market moved in, that was good. I suggested that we get some of the um, kiosks where people are selling, it was empty and we wanted to fill it up. So we got kiosks, I think from, I don't know where, from Fifth Avenue or something, and sold books. And then the next step was other booksellers brought their own tables and joined it. And it really became a terrible mess. So um, I can't accommodate. Oh, so um, Adam then, they hired uh, Tom Balsley and he did this whole thing and it went through the city planning commission and, and you and the community board. And um, it was finished and you were talking about naming a park. Uh, he called me and excuse me, asked me what should, what name did I suggest? And I took an hour or two to answer him. By that time he had said, it's too long. You took too much time. I don't know if anybody knew Adam Rose, but he was very impatient or he is. You took too much time. I'm naming it after the architect. So it became Bossy Park. And I, I all, um, excuse me, um, Condominium boards are like all other boards. Some people say one thing, other people disagree. So it's always kind of been a struggle to get everybody on the board to support really keeping that park well. So we went through a phase when the park wasn't financed as well. Uh, but when then Tom Balsey, we hired Tom Balsey to come back and, re and bring it back to the original design or close to it. And that's when we started, I think with the, with the community board, we went to the city planning commission. It went through a whole almost land use thing where, and then 
we were able to get the application to reactivate the kiosk. Um, and we've, we've really, I think, reasonably continued this. And when we, when Balsey came in with a second part, that was through, um, uh, well, well, Eric was the, the main thing, but so was uh, whatever, you know, our speaker, but he was not the speaker, then he was our local city council member. Anyway, we tried to maintain it. Some of the chairs of the community boards in between have been more generous than others. And so it's been a struggle and I've been its advocate now it seems from the very beginning. So my mother also lived in the Sheffield before it became a condominium. And so I saw what it looked like in different phases until it got straightened out. So that's my presentation about that. I mean, if you wanna, we are, we closed the park for the pan pandemic. Also the Park Van Dome started their facade repair and they were work they're working on the 56th Street side. So they have extended a shed and I don't know if it's a whole building or what, onto the park and that's closed the play area, which always, which has been in disrepair. It's just never worked. It's not really a play area. It's boring. The kids from the high school down the block come and hang out there. I don't know who else hangs out there. Um, and we closed the park. We can't, we can't control the pigeons. We can't control the neighbors, whoever they are, who feed the pigeons. Uh, I went there today and the park, the part of the berm that you see from 57th Street was lovely. <laughs> but the part that you saw from 50, from 9th Avenue had I counted 50 pigeons because that's where all the breadcrumbs were or whatever they were, were, were sent to them. It's very hard to keep it clean. It's just impossible. Our building sends somebody over there four times a, a day. We open it, we go and clean it, we clean it again, and then we close it. And that's that. Our, um, our kiosk operator wants to come back. I am just questioning what, the fu what we should be doing in the immediate future as long as the Park Vendome is continuing to do all of its facade things. I don't think it's particularly safe to keep the lower half of the park open. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, we're gonna suggest that we are bringing it back. I mean, we don't, wanna, we don't wanna really open the whole park. And since we suspect that people want the park op open or some people do, we would like to propose a compromise where we open the kiosk and the seating area for the kiosk and that we keep it somehow closed at the other end. In the meantime, last week or two weeks ago with the wind, I guess it was last week, <coughs> one of the old trees fell and it could have been a disaster had it been open. So you want me to tell you what we're doing now or do you want to ask questions? I guess uh, if there's more to share uh, in terms of what you're doing okay. to get the park open, that would be useful to know. <laughs> Excuse me. We have re we power washed and re. I <coughs> sorry, I don't know why I'm so. You haven't had the floor in a while, Ronnie. Like this, that may be why. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <coughs> We've we we now have been getting it ready and. Ever, actually, ever, when you, since you've invited us to come, we've heard that people want the park open. So we have power wash, scraped, and painted all the, the, the Spanish red walls, which a lot of us think are very ugly, but that was the color that was approved, so we've stuck with it. Um, <laughs> the pavement and walkways, they were also clean. We've signed a contract. We, we've hot engaged an architect, uh, Mark Morris. He went through to see, I, I skipped a step. When the park was closed and when the shed was being put up and the, and the, uh, the uh, Park Vendome was starting to do its facade work, there, a building inspector came and he, he cited us for violations. It's a very unspecific violation. We couldn't really tell what it was. 
So Mark Morris came down, walked the park. We pinpointed different areas that we thought needed repairs. And that's now what we're engaged in doing. Um, we've, uh, we have a contract. We're going to start with repairing those things that we saw. We've, we've fixed the gates. Uh, that was a, a big help that um, uh, we, we fixed the, the parts that were distorted so people could get in and we fixed other parts that needed some scraping and repainting. But we we didn't repaint the whole thing. The, the whole question of gates and, and the whole surroundings is up for discussion for next year. Um, we've got the scope of work, so we're starting that with what we call the trip hazards. Uh, we've received a quote actually from one, one vendor and we're waiting for two others. It'll cost us $53,000. The uh, Bartlett trees guys are coming to assess all the trees. They're removing the big tree that fell on Saturday. There's an apple tree that we think needs to be taken out also. And he eventually, and as soon as we can, we've signed a contract to have the trees pruned. Um, I don't know what else we've, anyway, so that's, we will replant, you know, and we'll replace the trees. There's no doubt about that. So that's about where we are now. I, I, the biggest problem we have are the pigeons. And I don't know who goes in there at night. We do have a periodic, I don't know how off, you know, regular, um, our security guy walks down. Uh, the police have been contacted by the security firm we have, and they are, they're very sensitive to the park and they come around, but it's very hard. You know, it is a, uh, I wish we could have it as a co-op, a park and that we could have Park Vendome, people on 56th Street, other people who use it um, can, you know, be part of it because I'm, our board is dependent on my basically pushing it. And it's quite a job. Next year, we are allocating around $200,000. We're gonna redo part in more detail, the pathways and benches and clean everything and, do, and the gates. But that's where we are now. This is a considerable quirk that the park the building's responsible for does not abut the actual property itself, correct? Right. It's not a Jason. It's block. It's right. a, the, the, the um, Sheffield, the whole park Vendome is in between the park right. and the Sheffield. So it's yep. very, you know, it's very hard. Um, I want to go to the committee for some questions. I just uh, say, with, Anita has been very helpful. We started off with we, great um, Janine, can we bring Anita over also? Sure. Sorry, thank you. Okay. We started off, there was great hostility because Anita <laughs> was, the, she was watching on behalf of everybody and we met at, and she's the one who really started the fact that the park needed repair. So uh, Eric and, and um, they, the office was so helpful to us because of, I mean, Anita, you're right, you're my friend now, right? I've always been your friend, Ronnie. <laughs> anyway, we try to work very carefully. And now we have the same managing agent that the Park Vendome has and that we have. So hopefully that's going to also help make things easier. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to Blake for a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for the work on this, Ronnie. Um, you know, I, I live on that block as well. So I <laughs> was asking by this and you know, I would agree with the sentiment that, you know, I think there's some need of painting and um, I think also replanting the grass because it's really patchy and I think it makes that berm a little less usable oh, when it's that, in. I'm sorry, I think that is in our plan for next year. I'm just going to make you a little louder. But you know what the trouble with the, the grass is? Not only the pigeons, but there are people who take their dogs on the grass. When I looked online for the history of the park and I, and I, pulled up, I think, a site that Tom Balsey, I don't remember which site it was. When it was first done, there were pictures of all of people, you know, sitting on the grass and enjoying the grass. That can't happen anymore. I'm sorry, Blake, I didn't mean uh, to interrupt you. Oh, no, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and the two other things, you know, I think um, the gate is also a design that really looks, um, you know, rather jail-like. Uh, you know, I wonder if there's right. another design that might be a little more um, friendly looking 
Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I would totally agree that the pigeons, you know, I think are the biggest issue with this park. And, you know, I'm wondering if when the park is monitored, if, you know, that person could spray down the sidewalk, even if just, uh, you know, remove the, the breadcrumbs or, you know, whatever is on the ground. Uh, even if it's four times a day, you know, that might discourage um, continuing to uh, that pigeon problem. I should, should have told you that we have two representatives, although I think that Liam Birmingham, who is the building manager, had to leave, but we have the managing, the manager, the building manager also in the audience. And so we, they're listening to this and we will sort of think, is Liam still on? Are they connected at all? No, all right. <laughs> but Liam, will, I'll talk to Liam about it. I think that the men do wash it down when they come, but I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Brad? You're on mute, Mr. Pascarella. <laughs> there you go. Yes, when the Park Van Dome uh, is working on their facade. Uh, in many cases, the neighbors work out a deal and it has to do financially saying, well, we're going to shut down a piece of your property. You're going to give me $50,000 or $60,000 because now you shut down a whole park. Has, was there any agreements made? And they also understand, you know, because Park Van Dome's right next to it, they get the finger pointed at them a lot. And this is definitely a Sheffield issue. You know, I don't want to go back to my history there, but um, I'm just wondering, curious about that. And also to get back to Park Van Dome, could it be possibly that they want to participate in a, in a budget that could be added uh, as an assessment uh, to their property to add to the maintenance of this property? Or, you know, what is that relationship now? I think our treasurer had talked about that a little bit and we would love that. Um, they're not, they're not contributing to the cost of it. We have worked out an arrangement, um, but it's not monetary, it, does, it doesn't include money, because we have the scaffolding. We're, the Sheffield was the first one to do the facade stuff. And our scaffolding went slightly, I think, affected, Anita, did it affect the park? Yeah, it went into our garden area. Right. And they were very helpful and very generous. So we're certainly not, inter I don't want them to pay us for their part of it. Uh, we just have been, I think we've been pretty understanding. We've always worked out a relationship about the scaffolding and stuff. So I, that, that's, you know, it's something, that's what happens in New York because the city council, and I'm afraid I was on it, when that local law 11 was passed. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Can I answer a question, <laughs> one of Brad's questions? Does anyone hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Um, the reason why the Park Vendome does not contribute to Bolsley Park is that we gave up our FAR so that um, Rose could build higher. Adam Rose could build higher, or or who was it? Shapiro could build higher. Yeah, it wasn't Adam. I think. Well, just to clarify, you didn't give it, it up. Shapiro. You sold your 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 you sold your air rights. Yes, and that was before the Park Vendome was converted. So we now have we don't have any more air rights, and I guess the way we feel is that okay, let's work something out with the Sheffield. But why should we have to pay for a park? that took away our air rights. We, we could certainly use those air rights. What would you do with the air rights? There's things we could do on the roof. There's the, things that we the could- The are so beautiful. The roof is, well, the roofs are so beautiful. I look over yes, them. Yes, but they can't be built out and they weren't. There's a lot we could do, but right now we can't do anything with our roofs. Uh, all I'm strictly saying is, right, we're trying to be neighborly. That was a deal done in almost 45 years ago. And now everybody wants to use that corner. And it also is an asset to Park Van Dome and the Sheffield to have a very active park. And all I'm saying is maybe the winds have changed inside the Park Van Dome. I'm not letting Sheffield off the hook. Just saying maybe it's a possibility. I'm not talking about $300,000 a year or anything like that, but uh, 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 maybe a deal where they help with their maintenance crew, wash it down. I mean, a, a bit more 
not thinking retro, but actually looking into the future. That's all I'm trying to bring up. I don't want to bring, you know, I understand what you're saying, but I just think at this point, and it's been a problem for years, maybe it's something to look at a little differently than something was taken away. It's a great idea, Brett. I love it. <laughs> but I mean, we can, we had, go on. Sorry, I was just gonna say, we advocate for, you know, partnerships like this all the time, public-private partnership. Um, you know, I think it's, it's notable to recognize that it's an, it would be a, a beneficial asset to everybody along that area, not just the Sheffield, but also the Park Bend Dome. Um, I want to keep going just in the interest of time. Chris? Yeah, no, I was actually going to bring up all the things that Brad said, uh, because it seems like an issue of financing the maintenance. I hear complaints about pigeons, and Blake had brought up a possibility of a uh, more frequent cleaning schedule daily in order to make the park habitable or usable um, or more appealing for use. Um, but that's it. So yeah, Brett, Blake, you guys hit it on the head for me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Sally, can oh, I, Ronnie, can I, Ronnie, please. Yeah, yep. I was gonna say and maybe, Anita. Anita, maybe we could work out a deal where the Park Vendome maintenance people would take one power washing during the day, or something like that. We could share some of that. Don't know. I, I really don't know. Because, well, I don't want you to make a commitment or anything. It's just yeah, and I cannot make a commitment. Right. So I, I'm just one of nine board members. But what I do see is that the problem with the pigeons is that the gate is closed. And if the gate were opened, if the park were opened again, uh, then the uh, people would not be tossing in seed. It's become a pigeon zoo. People are just standing outside by the gates and throwing their food in. I walked by today, people are just throwing in their garbage. I mean, if they're coming four times a day, they should be hosing four times a day. That's a way of discouraging the pigeons or getting security to come to, to uh, chase away uh, the people who are feeding the pigeons. All right, so maybe that's, we should discuss it more with their our building managers and the boards. And right, because now what is happening is that there are people standing on the sidewalk um, feeding the pigeons from the sidewalk. So now it becomes a challenge just to go um, up or down Ninth Avenue because you have pigeons on the sidewalk. And on the other, on the other side of the sidewalk, we have a lot of stuff for homeless people. So it is, right. a, I agree with you. But I just wanted to say, when the park was open, people braze, were brazen and, and just fed the pigeons. I mean, I went up to a guy one time and I said, really don't feed the pigeons because it really makes such a, he said, you know, go blank yourself. But and, <laughs> <laughs> So it kind um, of discouraged me from doing it. Yeah. Um, Sally? Yeah, it's kind of sad to listen to all this, and I'm just really uh, weighing in on Brad and Chris because this is very much a, a human behavior problem, and uh, it, it's nothing that's not fixable if people would just do the right thing. It is not legal in New York to feed the pigeons, and um, you know, feeding the pigeons, and um, what was the other problem? And the dogs pooping, you know, on the grass. It's just unacceptable behavior in a community and there seems to be it's it's kind of like and I don't really know how you fix it but it's kind of like the graffiti problem I don't know if more cleaning will help it but you know if you, graffiti goes on a building and you immediately wipe it off it's a way of controlling it because they keep putting it up and you keep wiping it off if you keep cleaning up the poop and the and 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 you stop the people from feeding eventually it will become clean but but, but it's an enforcement issue. I mean, you have a community of people that are, that are making it uninhabitable. But uh, so I'm just, you know, it, it, it's very sad. It is. It's almost like people who should be wearing masks and aren't wearing masks. I mean, it's just not the concern for the general community. Yeah. And I don't know what you do for people like that. So um, I, I, more I cleaning your... would help, yeah. Well, just constant cleaning. I, I, I don't know. I wish I had an answer for you, but I think Thank it's you. just <laughs> very sad <laughs> when the, the people are making it bad. Thanks, Sally. Um, two things. I'm going to go to Leslie before I go to Chris because Leslie hasn't spoken yet. But um, I think the key for us 
big picture is understanding when this is going to reopen, whether it's segmented or as a whole. Um, and then from an update standpoint, it, uh, you know, this was not meant to be um, an open meeting for the Park Vendome and Sheffield to have a conversation. I think you guys are capable of doing that, but it was a huge factor of community education for us to understand the struggles behind the space, why it exists, you know, all of what you guys laid out. Um, so with that, I'm gonna to go to Leslie and then to Carl from the speaker's office who's been involved with this as well. Leslie? Um, so I live on 55th Street uh, for the past almost 17 years. So I go by this all the time. And by the way, fun note, I sat next to Al Pacino in this park. So it is very dear to me <laughs> when he used to live there. Um, but uh, I think the problem here, and Jeffrey, you might know this as well, is that it's it's essentially a public park because it's on right on 9th Avenue on 57th Street, um, but it's but it's maintained privately. And the people who maintain it privately aren't even really adjacent to it, as Ms. Eldred said. They're, they're down the block a bit. So what's happening is that you know homeless are going in there, or not now because it's, it's locked up, or the maintenance is not as good as maybe you would see a regular city park because they just don't have the staff or the money or the, the constant um, attendance. And I think that's a problem. Like I don't know between which building how that's going to be rectified. But unfortunately, uh, the ma I think the maintenance is not to the level of a regular park that we see every day. So a lot of these things, the pigeons, the homeless, the uh, there's now there's some drug use are um, the dog, like she said, the dog poop is falling, you know, through the cracks. Yeah. So I, uh, Carl might be able to shed some light on how maybe that can be rectified through a, you know, when it's that private public kind of thing. I, I just Carl, I think. Oh. Can I add one more thing? We investigated putting a cameras around, but then the question came, who's going to respond to all of it? If there's somebody, you know, feeding exactly. the pigeons, who's going to respond to them? And the, the, the kiosk operator was a little helpful, but it, it more helpful for cleaning his area rather than the rest of the park. Anyway, Carl, or whatever. I don't mean to boss. Carl. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, Ronnie sort of proposed a, a half open uh, option. And I'm just curious about how the, park, uh, the, the committee would feel about that. And also, I'm, if that were to be something that we move forward on, how would, how would we delineate, you know, half is open, half isn't? Is that like a, you know, caution tape is stretched across the park? Or, you know, how would, how would that be uh, in, enforced, I guess? I, we haven't really discuss that and I yeah. we're planning to talk to the architect and also with uh, Liam who is our building manager and to come up with a proposal I don't know if it's possible it may not be possible and Ron I have another question because you know from our office's involvement earlier you know mm -hmm. when the pandemic started you know uh, I, you know, I had spoken a lot to Frank Carucci, who I think uh, at, at that time, and he told me that, you know, there were the, the, these uh, violations, I guess, uh, tripping, like uh, violations is like tripping hazards, I think it was what it was. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious, um, you know, are those substantial enough? Uh, what, yeah. where, where are those and how long would that, that seems like a big job to start. Well, it is. It's an expensive job. I, I think I gave you a figure, but I don't see it here. It's going to cost us... Um, we had the architect look and pick out what parts he thought. Um, we have, we've got three bids out. One has responded. It was $53,000. And we're going to do that. I mean, we're committed to doing that. We have to do that. And are those in, what part of the park are those in? I'm not those, sure. I think they're spread out. We're going to also next year, we're going to have to do all new sidewalks outside. You know, we're gonna have to, so, re you know, do that. Carl, okay. was there anything else? Leslie, I see your hand, don't worry. Was there anything else? No, um, I, I guess I just wanna be weary of like, if we're gonna, if there isn't a compromise of doing half the park, you know, be kind of, you know, the park's been closed because there's been concrete violations, but those are in the park that we're gonna, you know, open, you know, just, I'm just, you yeah. know, I'll see those. Well, and, uh, and, Carl, why don't you, um, why don't you, kind of contact both of us. I mean, I'm perfectly happy. I'm the person now who's back working on the park. All right. Okay. So um, 
we should pull it together and, and discuss it. And when they, we get the bids back and I know exactly what, where the tripping hazards are, uh, we should, you should come and we can show you and Anita will be there too. So happy to do that. Okay. Okay, Leslie, and then I'm gonna go to Chris and Brad. Ms. Eldridge, um, just one question. And you mentioned that you were talking um, with your board about this. Uh, since it's such a huge cost to maintain um, and it's really not adjacent to your property, has there been any talk of the Sheffield not, I mean, uh, yeah, the Sheffield not wanting it anymore or not, you know, wanting ownership of this park any longer, at, at least among some of your share of your uh, members? We've offered it back to the parks department and the you fact can't. that we would pay for the maintenance, but so far they haven't approved that. But that I think would be a very good solution. That I wonder if, okay. well, it's, it's, has there ever been a transfer of responsibility and ownership as a, as a pop to a city agency? Right. Um, we know that those relationships do exist the other way around where the city is the <laughs> owner and the private entity is the manager. But I don't, I don't, I can't think of another example we've seen this happen um, in the reverse. So. Well, we'll see, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Chris and then Brad. Yep. Thank you again. Uh, this is a quick question to Ms. Eldridge. I, I know that you had mentioned that there was a lot of uh, use by students there from the local high schools. Um, would you uh, entertain any partnership with environmental studies? I was an environmental studies student. I used that park after school in the fall and spring, and I loved it there when it was available and when it wasn't crowded. Um, but I know that like when you give kids ownership of something, they have a tendency of taking pride in its maintenance and its look. Um, in the future, would there be any outreach to, from the Sheffield to Ms. Najmi, the principal of environmental studies oh, yeah. for a shared um, maintenance program? I agree with you totally, Chris. I think that's a very good idea. Uh, I mean, we've also, I've also talked to some of the people who live on 56th Street one who was a gardener. I mean, he did a garden behind one of the buildings there, or two of the buildings, and I can't remember his name, but I can find it. And he wanted to do some, you know, some gardening there. I mean, it should be open to people to do that. The problem is, I guess, you know, who's going to supervise it, but we could work that out. I've always yeah. wanted to include some neighboring groups into the park. Yeah, I, I just feel like with only 40% of the student body at that high school now attending, and we don't know what next year is going to look like. There's missed opportunities for the National Honor Society right. um, volunteer moments. And that could be one of them. One of the intro classes that they used to do at environmental studies was urban environment. And all the students, all freshmen, had to get their pruning license, uh, <laughs> which was really fun. I still actually have mine in a box in storage. Um, and then the second one, as it relates to just habit, like just use of park, um, is, is there any appetite for signs noting uh, like the banning of the feeding of birds or dogs on lawn, much like Bryant Park has for like their grass area saying, hey, this is not for your dogs or anything to that effect? Well, I think we've tried it, but we haven't done, okay. you know, professional things, but I'd love to talk to you about it, the program, Chris, so I don't know. If you want my email address, I think they have it at the community board, but I'll give it to you now if you want to write it down. We'll, 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 we can have I'll the board office you, uh, connect Jesse. that with you. Okay. All yes. Right. Thank you so much, Ms. Eldridge. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go to Brad, and then I do want to uh, wrap up this item. Um, Brad? Yes, this is for the, uh, uh, the council member. Do we actually know the obligation of the Sheffield dollar-wise? It, what I mean, can they be fined? Can we go after them legally because it's not sitting and it's not being taken care of in a proper way? It, if if this was done, let's say in Hudson Yards with related, right? And they left one of those parks going bad, but we know where to go. This has been an ongoing problem for years. This isn't just uh, Ronnie to solve it now. It's not on her shoulder. I'm just trying to understand what their obligation is, and they're not living up to it. And, and then this, I think there's a lot of ways to handle it. Could there be just a board for the park? Uh, uh, with the, is there a local bid that can contribute? 
I, I think the idea of the high school students helps, but I think just pointing the finger now, it's, we're not getting anywhere. It's the same thing. And we don't even know when it's going to be open, half open. Well, so I'm just curious to our elected officials how this is being handled. To send DOB there to say, got some cracked sidewalks, uh, that's not really solving the problem. Brad, it, when it, before the closure, it was not great, but it was certainly fine, except again with the pigeons and the dogs. But um, if you complain, I mean, the community board was part of the process for the city planning commission approving of the, the new- I, Ronnie, I'm just trying to understand what monetary obligation is from the Sheffield. Is it a half a million dollars a year? Well, I think we can is get it just maintenance? There's is no it a million? There's no I'm specific- I'm just trying to understand what the obligation is and what years are they putting in the money and what years are they not? That's all. Well, I can have the treasurer explain it to you, but there is no specific responsibility except that we have to maintain the park in accordance with a plan that you participated in years a couple of years ago, approving what it looked like. And yeah. that's- I, I remember talking. being on the board. I remember it coming across. Yeah. Uh, you, you being brought back right. to its form of glory. I, I remember that, yes. Right. So I, I think the city could fine us if we weren't doing up to standards. I think we'd get fine, fined or, um, I, I had the staff today try to look through the original offering plan when SWIG first bought it, acquired it, to find out what the obligation was in the offering plan for the condominium. but. It's very complicated and it's not a user-friendly uh, report. So you have to go through the whole thing to find any references. I mean, Ronnie, all I'm trying to say is if you go in front of the Sheffield or in that park, your park right in front of your building is clean, it's maintained, it has a maintenance schedule, and it just doesn't seem the park is part of that. And I would love for Park Van Dome and their staff to help you, I'm not, but I just think the obligation needs to be stepped up. Yeah, that's. But I think that points out what's the ridiculous part of, of the the whole original deal. I mean, we have doormen in front of so that they can maintain order in the plaza part in front of the building, but we can't have the doormen, you know, down at the park. It's the fact that it's not contiguous contributes to the difficulty of it. But so. I, the continuous thing to me, though, is you're talking, it's on the same block. It's right there. It's right down. It's, that argument to me is weak. The, everybody can walk down the park there. I, I just think there's more to it. And I also didn't hear, um, Jeffrey, when is the park actually going to be open halfway? In a month? As soon as, we, to understand. As soon as we uh, repair the, the, uh, the problems that, are, that we've identified. All right. right. And you're waiting on bids and for that work to happen. Right. Yeah. Happen? But Jeffrey, the public is asking and we can't say, well, they're waiting on bids. Well, we yeah. have to say know, bids I... are due in two weeks. Our bids are due in a week. The park's going to make a decision in a week. You know, we can't say to the public, they don't know. We don't know. We're just going to wait. No, Brad, I, I agree with you entirely. This is one of the problems with POPs, quite frankly, across the entire city. Um, uh, I don't know how the public forces the hand of the managing entity and the ownership. Um, well, I think we do. We have elected officials. And I remember Gail Brewer used to come down on the shuffle pretty hard during construction. And she moved mountains to get things done. So I'm not buying the fact that we don't have an answer for so, an area that needs, needs to park. Okay, I, the, I have two suggestions here. Um, there's an open dialogue between the Parks Vendome and the Sheffield, which is great. Let's keep, let's encourage that to keep going. Um, the speaker's office has been involved. I know the board, CB4 board staff has been roped in on certain stuff like that as well. I think a lot of ideas were proposed tonight um, that, that those respective boards can consider. In terms of a, a statement, a letter that CB4 can make, is it a broad question about POPs to our elected officials? Is it a specific ask as it relates specifically to this uh, location? Um, and if so, what and to who? 
Any committee members with a thought on that? I mean, if we don't take action, that's fine too, because we can ask um, the Sheffield and Park Vendome for updates in due time. But if there's desire to take an action, um, I'm open to suggestion. Marty? I don't have a desire to take an action, uh, but you are raising a whole lot of uh, questions about POPs that I don't know much about. So uh, I think this is one of very few POPs in Community District 4, actually. They're super common in Community Board 5, 6, and 1. Um, so Midtown, East, you know, the East Side, and, and Lower Manhattan um, were visit, big zoning trade offs. Didn't Jeffrey, you know, visit, can, can I just ask a question? Another, let, let me finish my thought, and then, and then sure. your, it's yours. Thank you. Didn't we visit another pop at, at one point? And um, you, Jeffrey, are raising whole lots of information that we need to have about pops before I think we can write a letter that's sensible. Okay, thanks, Marty. Anita? Yeah, there, there was a, you can speak to JD about it because there was a hearing in land use four years ago about trying to compel the Sheffield to fulfill their obligations. He's actually on this committee, so I'm going to have to uh, shame him for not being here to opine on it this Thanks. evening, but well, good to know. He's pretty familiar with it. But what I wanted to say is right now, there is a problem with the pigeons. The pigeons, I, I was trying to express, they're now on the sidewalk. What, do we get, what can we do about those pigeons? The only way to solve the pigeon problem is by opening the park. Yet, can we? You know, may I just defend us because we have tried to maintain the park. The parks were closed with a pandemic. That was right. that Correct, Ronnie. months, you know? And well, what can we do about the pigeon? I, Anita, let's not have a back and forth. Um, Sorry. One at a time, please. Ronnie, go ahead. Well, it was mandated to get closed. So mm -hmm. we didn't go in to maintain it, also because the, the Park Vendome started their construction and they, that really made us close off the playground part and, and part of it. And I don't know if you want people sitting in the park when you've got scaffolding not too far away from you. So it's been a very complicated procedure trying to reopen it. But we have long-term planned big renovations. I mean, we're pen gonna spend more than $200,000 just to spruce, up, put some new plant and stuff like that. So, I mean, I don't think that, I didn't mean to give the impression that we're not interested. We always have had it. It's just not been the top priority at different times with different boards, but we fully intend to bring it up to code, which means, you know, f uh, answering the, the violations and keeping it as well as we can. And we will continue to talk with Anita and with the Park Vendome, and we'll figure it out. But she's raising a mo more important question, which is really, I don't know if you have pigeons in other parts of your district, but what are we supposed to do about pigeons? It's not enough really to say, well, you got enough people in the park that'll you know, clear it out. That's, it doesn't happen. Carl, is that, do you know if that's health department, much like they regulate rats, or not yeah, regulate, but uh, attempt to, uh, is this a health department question? Yeah, may, yeah, that's what I was trying to think. Um, possibly, I'm sure that they might have some sort of um, recommendations uh, on it. Um, but, you know, the fact is, if there's going to be people that are going to be throwing breadcrumbs out, it's going to be hard to keep pigeons away. I mean, you know, that's, right. that's a, big, a big part of this, too. And, you know, it maybe may we, could get some, we could get some hawks um, to <laughs> reside at the corner of 57th and 9th. Sorry, I had to lighten up the moment there. Um, so I, I do actually think it's a, a prudent thing to understand uh, if pigeons, which if they're considered a vermin, is that health department uh, in this case and how they manage those types of things. Um, Anita, I see your hand yeah, and then I want to wrap this up. Yeah, I wanted to explain the shed. So the shed cuts into about a third of the children's playground, but the children's playground I mean, it has, it was supposed to be renovated four years ago. The Sheffield had promised they were going to renovate the children's playground. So now here, here it is, it's underneath the seats, there's mildew. It, they can't, we can't get the mildew. The flooring has holes in it. So it's really not 
um, it, it's not for children. Children can't use that playground. What I would suggest is just put a lock on the children's playground and maybe put fencing in around the children's playground so that no one could hop into the children's playground because that's one of the favorite places for the students to go to, uh, but no one's in school anyway, but, uh, or for the homeless to sit or for the drug dealers to sit. But I do think if the park at this point, if the park were open, there the um, pigeons would go to the um, south side of the park. Right now, they tend to be by that sort of, um, you know, by the grass. People are just standing and throwing in at a part where normally the pigeons, or in the past, the pigeons were not in that part of the park. Now the pigeons are everywhere. It's, it's crazy. I mean, it's- Thank you. Call it Pigeon Park. Um, so, good alliteration. So Jeffrey? Yes. Uh, so I know that the health department will consider any um, egregious piling of pigeon um, remains, feces, uh, as an actual health concern. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, what's the word? Not, it's, it's just a breathing problem. I know that there have been instances that I've read in New York Post and Daily News in the past where like air shafts and stuff like that have been covered in it and it's actually caused um, health conditions. So I know that the Department of Health actually does respond to this. Thank you. Um, you know, there were, I, I feel between a rock and a hard place. We wanted education on the matter. Uh, the Sheffield is responsible and has commitments um, to the community to, you know, maintain and open this park. It sounds like at the same time, um, they have work to do so the park can safely open. Um, we would be up in arms anywhere else if there was um, a danger in a public park or a sidewalk um, and we needed that to be repaired um, accordingly. So what I don't know is what kind of a commitment we can get from the Sheffield to, to expedite, um, ensure that these repairs move forward and that there will be a safe plan to reopen as, as soon as is possible. We will be glad to make that, that promise to, I mean, that declaration to you. Uh, we are moving as fast as we can. We're in the last, we, we, we're gonna award this contract. They're gonna do the repairs. We'll open the park. I mean, it'll be fine, but yeah. um, it's not. And then the question in the meantime is what can be done about sort of um, aesthetic maintenance of pigeons and um, trash collection and all that kind of stuff. Now, Free, it's histoplasmosis is maybe what the word you're looking for with the pigeons. It, it could be. Yes. <laughs> um, so I can offer to, you know, speak to the health department tomorrow and, you know, perhaps we can uh, go visit the park with the health department person to kind of look at conditions. That um, sounds like a great idea. Mm -hmm. And, and let me just explain about the, the plans for next year. We have our fiscal year ends in December. So we are, we don't have the money right now to do some of this stuff. So we will, we're planning to do it in the beginning of the year, put the money in for next year's budget. Do you have to wait until January to do that 50, to do the, the sidewalk repairs as well? No, or can that, that be the done? Sidewalk repairs, yes. But the, the, the trip, dangerous and the, those things inside the park no we're doing that so now. no matter the the trip hazards will not be completed until at least 2020 middle of no 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 that's not true because we've never been cited for the sidewalk we're just saying that we need to do it okay so the trip hazards which is what's preventing the yeah, they're gonna, open, I, right? hopefully they'll be done within the next three weeks excellent so that's fantastic news that that that's a much quicker time frame than i would have expected no. Um, no, we're really, okay. we're really working on it. <laughs> so how are folks feeling right now? I'm not sure where we could send a letter. Um, I think it's important that we're having this conversation because as much as it's privately owned, it is a public entity. Um, is there a sentiment right now to do something or will we put some, put some, lever give some leverage to Carl, um, talk to the, health department, get a tour going, uh, and we can see what happens from there. 
Um, and Jeffrey, I just would like to say if there's anything Assemblymember Rosenthal's office can do to help. I know before I was with the office, it was something that we were involved in. Um, so we'd be happy to help continue the conversation with everyone. Thanks, Emily. Appreciate yeah. that. Maybe, you know, let's, you know, we, we can have an initial conversation with the health department tomorrow. Um, if the board would like, I think, you know, maybe we could arrange for a visit there that, you know, the stakeholders can meet. And well, anyway, we were all planned for the visit, you know, the other, yesterday, I guess. Yeah. That was me. Yep. But I also wanted to have the, our, our committee discussion on this matter too. Yeah. Um, Marty? So, I, I, what I'm hearing uh, sounds like uh, folks involved with the park are going to move forward. Uh, I don't think there's anything that our committee could do except to ask for a short report back in two months. I think that's reasonable. Does uh, Ronnie, Anita, does that sound yeah, reasonable to great. you guys? That's great. Yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe somebody can come up with a pigeon remediation solution. <laughs> I said a hawk, so we need a resident Hell's Kitchen hawk. That's a great um, idea. <laughs> a couple of them. Jeffrey, while we're, we're on this, the, the playground area is not a playground. I mean, when it was fixed, it, it needs new pave, it needs new covering because it has a playground covering on it. But we've thought often about changing the use of it. But if we change the use of it, we have to come back. I, I don't know if we have to go back to the city planning department or we we have to we will definitely be coming back to you but i don't think right. that's going to happen until for a while okay <laughs> we'll, we would certainly welcome we'll that we being a part of that discussion it. right okay yep. okay um i'm gonna move this at yes an owl to sally i'm fine with either um i'm gonna move on from this topic thank you all for being here ronnie anita uh for your thank representing you. of your buildings um, we like good public spaces, so appreciate having the conversation. And we appreciate your interest. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to make the next item uh, pretty quick, in part because I aired before uh, this meeting and, and Marty and I didn't close the loop on the budget um, priorities. Uh, as you guys all know, um, uh, the community board is responsible for developing our statement of district needs. Um, each committee is charged with determining what our priorities will be. Um, those, each committee's priorities then get sent to the budget task force. Um, they get shaken up in a big jar and then we pull out a number. No, that's not how it works at all. But um, our job is to I prioritize, <laughs> Glenn, our job is to prioritize um, the, our district needs for the waterfront parks and environment. We have an existing list. As a committee, we've always worked from an existing list to Re uh, establish our wins that we've had from past years, um, reprioritize that list if need be, um, and come up with new asks. What I'm going to say this evening is Transportation Committee did a survey um, that worked really well, I think, um, where they sent around a survey of our existing asks, and committee members were asked to prioritize them, and then you were asked to add any new items to that list. You'll recall that we do this for capital and expense. Um, most of our asks for parks are capital, though so things like staffing are expense, and we always ask for staffing. So um, that is a, a quick rundown of, of the thought that uh, for this process um, that I should have had more for you prepared this evening, but this doesn't prevent us from moving the topic forward. Do folks feel generally comfortable with that, Alan? Uh, I think we also need to include uh, some issues uh, affected, affecting us through the uh, from COVID. Take that into account as opposed that to just exactly working what the, That's what, so we wouldn't want to remove anything. This is a big topic of discussion at the Budget Task Force was in the age of the pandemic, how do we present priorities given the state of the city's finances, um, the state of our district, and how is that looked at through the lens? And it was agreed that we would never, we would not want to remove anything from our existing asks just because it's a pandemic um, and, and the bank account is low, um, but to double down on those and then to see what we've learned through what we've lived um, and see what needs to come of that now. So, you know, folks are going to have a right to prioritize accordingly. And I think, I think all of us take COVID into consideration right now when we're making our decisions. 
So Alan, the whole there would be a section to add things based on on new. I would caution that if it's a new item, the board would have had to have taken a position um, on it. So we can't just say, um, you know, Ballsley, Ballsley Park needs a million dollars. The board hasn't taken a position on that at this point yet. So process wise. Um, yeah. um, possibly we could do that in the narrative. In the we, summary, do something as a, as a narrative in terms of what we might want or might what we, 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 we hope to see as opposed to specific items, as you mentioned, that, that haven't come before the committee yet. Yes, I think so. The struggle is on the other side. This is a report that we have a very technical way of reporting to Department of City Planning um, how our priorities get put into the system. And so each committee can't necessarily have a narrative. Um, we can have a paragraph in the budget task force letter, which would be up to the second vice chair. Um, no, you, so you, I, have the, you have the summary uh, before, before the priorities. No, we have that that section there that we express, you know, what, what our concerns are. Maybe something in there we can throw in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Marty, I saw your hand as well. No, I, I didn't, uh, I don't think I raised my hand, but I, I, I okay. uh, think we need to uh, resend out uh, that list and ask members to look at that, that list uh, from previous years so that we can, I mean, I know what some of the Janine, items- was it in the Dropbox? Yeah, that was a whole budget uh, yeah. folder in the Dropbox. Okay. Yeah, so, so we're going to keep that folder there. Um, no, so it's that not folks just keep can... the folder there. It's it's ask me because I haven't looked at it, and I doubt I'm unique in this. Ha ask the committee members to take a look at uh, that part of the folder. In you might want to send out a uh, a specific location to us for it, and to to look at it and come back uh, maybe next month with. A sense of what the priorities are. I don't know what the time frame is. We have a, we have a time factor, um, so hence the circulation of the survey um, to consider our pre-existing priorities and how our pre-existing asks, and then have each member prioritize those, and right. it works out in the survey how that's done. Um, and if anybody has new stuff to add, that can be considered. By when? Uh, frankly, by the time I uh, turn around the survey, I think Budget Task Force meets, Leslie, I'm kind of looking at you or Alan, the 22nd, I believe. Yeah. So we, this, the committee needs to turn this around um, in the next two weeks. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward survey. I'm happy to get it together and get it out to everybody if, if everybody feels comfortable with that. So I feel, I feel comfortable with it, and I appreciate you doing the work to get the survey out. And what this conversation is saying to all the committee members is that when you receive notice from Jeffrey to go to wherever the survey is, look at it in the next couple of days and send it back as fast as you can. Yep. Brad, was that a hand? Yes. I just want to comment on the thought of the budget. This is like saying to your family, we're broke, let's go buy a new car. And I don't care where the money comes from. In my opinion, we have to help the city. And we should say to the city, our priority, because we understand what's going on, is we want a clean park and we want some maintenance, right? I don't know this philosophy of doubling down. I just, I'm not really understanding it because to I, me, it's very unrealistic and not very helpful to our community. I, I would don't. Say I double yeah, down. Priorities was, uh, to keep I things clean and get some garbage picked up. I missed on opinion. the double down factor. The the set the consensus from the budget task force was that we recognize that priorities will shift significantly given the state of the fi the city's finances and the state of the city. We shouldn't expect committees to willingly remove things from their their budget ask list, and so the whole list should be out there, and it's up to each committee to prioritize it accordingly. And Brad, I think you're 100% right that we're going to see some shifting in priorities of keep it clean, keep it open, um, and the rest is is sort of frosting from what we can get right now. Um, doubling down oh, sure. wasn't the right um, term at all, so I apologize for that. Uh, but we also, the Budget Task Force felt strongly it didn't want to lose sight of all those lower tier asks 
just because the money's not there doesn't mean it shouldn't be sort of in the mix. Actually, I think Jesse said to keep it on, right? Just for next year, just to make sure it's in their vision. So that will get circulated. Thank you everybody for that. Um, Katie, um, Janine, can we bring Katie over um, for what I hope is very quick um, oh, sure. on new business? And then uh, if anybody else has any new or old business, um, we're gonna take that. But Katie had messaged um, wanting to um, bring something up today. Katie? Hi, I mean, you kind of touched on it just now with talking about cleanliness of the city. We all know sanitation had huge cuts. It's really bad. If you've walked on 10th Avenue, every corner can is constantly overflowing. There's trash in the street. It's gonna go in the storm sewer. It's gonna go in the river. Um, the sanitation has had to halt their e-waste um, pickups, their safe disposal events until next summer. So there's a lot of things that are really, um, we're losing as far as from the environmental side of this. Um, I think sanitation often gets forgotten. There are huge essential service, especially during the pandemic. There's more residential trash and there are less um, sanitation workers now. And we do have this month potentially losing more sanitation workers. So I know that should be like a super huge priority. That's all I really wanted to say. Uh, appreciate that entirely, uh, Katie. Um, we're down to, I think, one pickup a day, six days a week um, on the litter yeah. cans. It used to be as much as three well, pickups a day on some so, of those litter cans. So and, we are yeah. very much aware of it. And I did hear we are supposed to be getting three additional basket trucks in this uh, CB4 area. So that should help. But I still haven't noticed any significant change on 10th Avenue. I think 10th Avenue is always forgotten. It has no supplemental cleaning. There's no bids. There's nothing there that helps mitigate the situation where 9th Avenue has ACE that is there five days a week to help clean and empty the cans. Which is Avenue funded is by the busy. city. That's a city council funding initiative. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I can speak for everybody and say we agree wholeheartedly and um, recognize that sanitation is a very important part of our budget consideration. Great, thank you. Uh, anybody else? on new old business. Jeffrey, I have one question about the Sheffield. Is there a bid over there? No. no. Nothing, huh? No. Nothing. Because it, it should, that would be a great idea to fold it into a bid. That's a really good idea, but there is not. I mean, the Lincoln Square it could be a the good meatpacking district bid. <laughs> Little we are looking for more rats. space. <laughs> we would love a bid. Google is in the meatpacking district. They might be willing to help. A little bit too far away. You're no, to I don't Lincoln know. Square. <laughs> we could run um, a ferry there. <laughs> Any other? Um, Google is everybody. Everywhere. Thank you for um, tonight. Um, this was a great meeting. And also, um, no formal letters, just this survey to get out. So um, thank if you, there's Jeff. no other business, motion to adjourn. Thank you, Jeffrey. Good job. Thanks, Marty. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Stay Jeffrey. safe. Bye. Bye -bye. Thanks, Jeffrey. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.